Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. Welcome to this episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio. I am your host, Dr. Jake Porter, and I'm so excited today to share with you a conversation that actually took place earlier this year for the Choose Connection Summit. The Choose Connection Summit is an annual uh, free online event for couples who are um, walking the journey toward healing from betrayal and sex addiction. And uh, it's something that I put on every year and try to invite colleagues, friends of mine to come on and be a part of it. This year, I was so honored to be joined by Fran Hopwood as we um, did an interview really in honor of her late husband, Richard Butler. After career in education, Fran switched from uh, to personal coaching and mentoring in 2017 after walking her own recovery journal, journey from betrayal trauma after discovering sex addiction in her marriage. Fran uses her own experience of the challenges of healing and her professional knowledge and skills to support other partners seeking freedom and growth from the effects of problematic sexual behavior in their relationships. Her passion is working with women affected by betrayal, and it stems not only from being a partner, but also from her experience of two previous marriages affected by infidelity. She's a certified APSATS partner coach. She's a professional partner trauma mentor, and she's a partner group peer facilitator. She's received lots of additional trainings and disclosure preparation from Dan Drake and Janice Cottle. Um, She's been trained in Gottman's work. Uh, my couple center recovery model, the Urca model of Carol the coach. Uh, she's a part of the team at the Naked Truth Project in the UK, which is a charity with the mission to open the eyes and free lives from the damaging effects of pornography. Richard, Fran's husband, was committed to helping other men in their recovery, and he also became an ICF certified coach and professional mentor. He was the first male coach with the Naked Truth Project, and because of his commitment to being partner sensitive in his approach, became the very first European male to become certified with APSATs. Very sadly, to the whole APSATS community, Richard died on the 29th of August of 2022 after a short illness. Uh, Fran and Richard really have been some of the warmest, dearest people that I've met professionally and been able to develop uh, a friendship with. They are an absolute delight. Richard's death really did shake many of us. And so when I asked Fran to have a conversation about their story, about Richard, about his recovery journey and his commitment to the APSATS model and being partner sensitive, I was thrilled when she uh, took me up on that. And so uh, both for this episode and the next, we're going to have a conversation with Fran and we're going to hear her share about her life and her journey with Richard. Before we turn to that conversation, I do just want to make you all aware uh, about some things coming up with the Association of Partners of Sex Addicts Trauma Specialists, APSATS, uh, who is the um, the, the fuel behind this, this podcast coming up on July the 7th, um, our very own president is doing, uh, sex addiction, abstinence contracts, what partners and those working with partners need to know. That's a one hour workshop on Friday, July 7th. Then we have a panel discussion, uh, on Friday, August the 4th. A one-hour discussion, successful clinician coach collaboration for betrayed partners. And then on September 1st, another one-hour workshop, the partner's role in couples work that will be uh, presented by Kim Hansen um, Peroni and uh, one of our APSATS certified coaches. Lots of other stuff coming up on the website. Go to appsats.org to find out more. But I don't want to take up any more time uh, and turn now to my conversation with Fran.
Well, hello, Fran. Welcome to the 2023 Choose Connection Summit. I'm so glad you agreed to be a part of this. The truth is I adore you and I adore Richard. And when I had the idea to do this session and and really honor him and remember him, um, I just prayed that you would you would be on board for it. And it thrilled me when you said yes. So thank you again for being here and doing this. Yeah. So let's just start out. Um, I just want to give you an opportunity to tell, tell us all a little bit about you and Richard as a couple. Yeah. Okay. We, um, well, we met, um, we met in our late thirties, to be honest. Um, I went to work in a college where Richard was there and he was my boss. Um, but within a year and a half, I was his boss. So some people say that never changed. You know. <laughs> um, but uh-huh. um, we, uh, I'd been married twice before and both marriages had ended with betrayal, not through sex addiction, but betrayal wow. uh, with, with other women. Um, and I had two children from my second marriage, two daughters. And Richard had been married once before. He had two sons, and his two sons were exactly the same age as my daughter's, which was totally coincidental. But um, we started to work together, and um, I don't know. There was something. There's something sparked off between us in terms of. Um, I don't know. He, I think we brought out the best in each other, and we had some really good complementary skills. So we we started a small business on the side, um, a health and safety business. And you know, he had the skills. He's a bit of a showman and the business acumen. And I had my passion for learning, um, and for really experiential yeah. learning. And making creative curriculum was kind of my my key thing. So it worked. It worked together. And so w- that kind of yeah. Um, what what, I guess, what were the fields that you were in? What were you teaching at the college? We were both we were both chemists. I'm sorry. We were both chemists, but this was health okay. and safety. And Richard liked to do the sort of pyromaniac stuff, you know, the the demonstration <laughs> stuff. And, and I liked the solidity of exercises that gave people real skills, you know, and it worked. It worked. Yeah. But okay. I guess what happened wow. is we had this really so... good in- intellectual intimacy and that turned into a physical intimacy and, and a level of emotional intimacy. But if I'm honest, our emotional intimacy was limited by me, to be honest, because of the past. Mm. I was, you know, I had to keep myself safe and um and we've got separate children and we've got separate oldies and, and separate jobs. And I think um, I recognised that Richard was not as emotional as, as my previous partners, but I just assumed it was personality or, you know, I, all the skills that he had that I now know were red flags. I saw them as entrepreneurship, busyness, you know, I, I had other names for them that, that meant I didn't see them as anything that was a red flag. Wow. Wow. Okay. And so, and so uh, a, a relationship was born and, and uh-huh. then what? Then we moved in together. Um, Richard was keen on getting married. I didn't want to do that. I'd done it twice. It hadn't worked. So we, we lived together for 12 years and, I guess our relationship was in three parts. It was like the busy years, you know, when the children were young, the oldies were around. And then we had these middle years when our careers started to diverge and we became empty nesters and we became orphans and um, we were approaching retirement and had all these dreams about what that was going to be. But the reality was when that happened, we both kind of escaped into work and and the, I started to recognize this deep disconnection and and that was the time the addiction started um which I guess was uh-huh. mainly down to broadband but there had also been in the UK a big sexual abuse investigation um at that time um to do with um, a disc jo- jockey Jimmy Savile you know, it was big news. And I have a feeling that that awoke something in him and that and the internet was enough to start off things that had been suppressed for years and things I knew nothing about, we never talked about. 
Wow. So, wow. Um, and so I'm thinking, is this like some... in the late in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s? Yeah, this would have been is that the late time 90s, frame we're talking about? Here? Late 90s, yeah. And so, um, okay. and then there was 2013, which was D Day. So that was like stage three of the relationship, um, D Day and beyond. Okay. And, and, um, just as much as you might want to, can you share a little bit about your D day? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, um, well, the initial D day, all I found was some emails to another woman. And, um, but that was enough for me, you know, with my history, it just, I just completely flipped. I couldn't believe it was happening again. You know, this, <laughs> it's like lightning striking three times and, um, and, Something in me told me that this was, I, I didn't believe that Richard didn't care about me. I just didn't believe that. So I, I, I knew it was a tip of the iceberg. And I went into um, massive, massive hypervigilance. And he went into absolute, solid, stalwart denial. Whatever I asked, he lied, wow. he minimized, he omitted. Um, but, you know... <clears throat> Forensically, I was into bank accounts, I was into phone records, I was into emails, I was into everything. And drip by drip by drip, different information came out and I realised that this was massive, that it was much bigger, that it involved acting out with other people. But passively, almost what I called passively, and that kind of made it okay until... um. And I, I, I don't know, I think at that point, maybe it was a God thing. You know, we didn't have a spiritual connection at, at that time at all. But I think it was a God thing that one day I just got this word sex addiction in my head because nothing else made sense. It, nothing else made sense. And I didn't even know what it was. You know? Wow. But we looked on the Internet. Well, I looked on the Internet, sat him down, and we went through one of these surveys. And and that's when I learned there was porn at the back of it. And I just I just couldn't believe that. That just didn't make any sense either. Um and then I realized that we were dealing with something that was much, much bigger than than um than we could cope with on our own. Wow. Well, you know, hearing you describe Richard as, you know, defensive and in denial and stonewalling, it's he was a different man by the time I met him. And so I have a hard time picturing that. <laughs> I I do. I have a very difficult time imagining that. So, so let you know, that drip, 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 that little by, by little finding out more and more, discovering more and more, that's, that's clearly a, a major obstacle and a major wound from those early yeah. days. What other major obstacles in the early days of recovery uh, did you and Richard encounter? I think, um, it was my isolation, really. I, you know, once I'd got this label, um, he felt this this big shame, but I just felt shame too. I I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want to tell anyone. I didn't want anyone to judge me for staying. I didn't want anyone to judge me, judge him. It it just felt like something that was too um, too horrible to talk about. And um, and besides, I'd done nothing wrong. So I didn't need any kind of fixing. But once I realized that um, Richard had crossed the bottom line, if you like, that what was my what I thought was my bottom line boundary, although I didn't have that language then, obviously, once we'd crossed that, um, I just went into shock. I, you know, um, and to be wow. honest, he didn't tell me that. And he tricked himself into having to tell me that truth um, because that happened after we booked a disclosure. And he knew he was going to have a polygraph. Uh -huh. But I just went into total shock, even though I'd been expecting it, and started to shake and just lost the ability to speak and talk and ended up in hospital, um, which was horrible, being wow. taken by ambulance and he wasn't allowed in the ambulance. And But it, it was the first time I told my story to anybody. And... Um, I spent the night with two mental health nurses. They just wanted to make sure I wasn't a danger to myself. And um, they told me I'd got PTSD. Um, and a doctor wow. came in and saw me and he said, you, you need support. You need some medication. You need something to help you. And it made the, 
a big difference to me because I came out of there and I had a diagnosis. I had, okay, so the way I, what, mm. the reasons I'm behaving as I am are because something has happened to me. And, and all those behaviors, I'm not crazy. They're just things that I'm doing to find safety. And I got some medical help from some things to help me sleep and um, calm me down a little bit. And, and that was sort of the beginning of, of re being really rational about how we were going to deal with this, you know. Um, okay. We didn't know what kind yeah. of help to get at all. And in the UK, it's not that easy. Um, we had the first the first therapist that Richard had. We had two disclosures with her. They were not nothing like a therapeutic disclosure, and I got about ten percent of the information. Uh, but she oh, said, wow. "Well, you've been." He'd been sober yeah. for three months. He went into immediate sobriety. So as far as she was concerned, three months he was cured. But this was during the time we were still getting this drip, 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 you know. And um, by then I'd started to research stuff wider than the UK. Um, and I found um, I found Milton Magnus. Um, I yes. just said to Richard, you have a choice. If you want this marriage to work, this is what we're going to do. I don't care what it costs, um, but I'm not going to push you. I will, I'm not your controller. It's up to you. And the next day he went ahead and booked it. So it was what our retirement funds went on, really. <laughs> oh, wow. And you came here to Houston, to, to my we hometown. came to Houston, to your hometown. We did the three-day, you know, the... Yes. Everything before the present, the yes. polygraph, and then the, how do we, how do we move forward? And I have to say, by then Richard was able to tell the whole truth. He passed the the polygraph with flying colours, and pretty soon afterwards, um, we went to um, a couples retreat with Milton and his wife, and five or six oh, other okay. couples. And um, you know, it was almost like going from the crisis stage to the rebuilding stage without doing any of that grief work in the middle. But it, it, it was an exciting thing to do, to go and go and do that and to see other couples. Um, Did you do that then, like, back, on the same trip? No, no, we came home. Was and went that on back the same trip? Later. Okay. No, okay. no. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, um, okay. Wow. Wow. Going home, we had to find a new, well, I think I, we decided that Richard would use the same therapist as I was using. Um, and so we okay. both had the same person, but we'd, you know, we'd um, made a decision that we would tell each other everything anyway. It, it, I couldn't have any more secrets. I didn't want any more secrets. But I think one of the biggest obstacles was yeah. um, Richard just regressed. He's, he just went into a childhood state, you know. If I was to ask him any questions or hmm. if we tried to talk about things, he would get small and his voice would go up and and um, he would scratch his arms and, and, and shield his head like this. And I, it just didn't seem right to me that that was going on, you know. That was that was how I knew that there was something something behind in his past and... You know, luckily we were able to draw that out before going to see Milton, um, and, and that that was wow. that was pretty hard. But but I suppose it, in a yes. sense, it gave yeah. me the compassion that I was looking for for what he was going through. Yeah. Mm, wow, you you knew something of the reason, which is not I an excuse. Of the reason that makes right? There's sense a difference between me. a reason and an excuse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It felt it, well, it because well, tell, none of the rest tell of me it more. made sense. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Well, tell me more about Richard's individual recovery. You know, what what was his path like and and what were the things that you saw along the way that began to give you trust that that it's real? Um I think I think more than anything it was uh that he was um he was committed to recovery. He was absolutely committed to recovery. Um, he, we, we, both of us had resisted 12 steps. You know, you read all the books um, when we were trying to fix it at the beginning. And um, the problem with the books is they've got so many things that talk 
direct you to 12th step, well, certainly at that time. Um, we didn't have faith, so we didn't think that was an option. Um, and, you know, the idea of him being with a load of other addicts was just horrific to me. But once we'd been to Milton's intensive, we had to go to 12-step groups in uh, in Houston, and I went to the ISA group. And, and it just felt like community. So, you know, I think accepting that we needed community was huge, huge. So oh, Richard wow. got involved yes. as well, and, and he became totally committed, even though for him it meant a big travel. Um, we, uh, he, was, he was also, uh, we just made it a, a project, if you like. We educated ourselves. We were both pretty committed lifelong learners. We read books together. We read them out loud. We um, found out more. We realized that there was a far better um, load of information over in the US. So we kind of got involved in communities further afield as well. We did um, we did the Bravehearts mentoring right almost pretty early on just to sort of be with other people. And, and those kind of things really made a difference. And um, yes. And I think that commitment went further because it was almost like he was committed to solving problems. You know, we we very much, if we can't help it because we were both teachers, we used a lot of symbolism and um, I, I brought our uh, our ugly man. Oh, yes. I think I've showed you before. I love the ugly book. man. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Ugly man was our, um, our trauma symbol because we accepted he had trauma, I had trauma. And this dear old ugly man was on the table when we were having difficult conversations because it meant that we were both addressing the trauma. So we were on the same side. And um, and I brought you his little, um, what he used to have in his pocket. It's a, a little heart that I had given him that he carried everywhere. And, and what was his like recovery sobriety wallet? And the first thing it says is no. Um, and he's got... <laughs> He's got the serenity prayer in there and photographs of me, um, the 12 step stuff, um, a little card I had given him and um, uh, a Buddhist monk because he was very, very uh, into in the early days, the whole hungry ghost thing, the idea of addiction being a hungry ah, ghost. Yes. And that really helped him. And he had this this guy inside his um, bathroom cupboard so he would open it when he was shaving in the morning because he had hated looking at himself because he hated himself so much so the Buddhist monk was there to remind him and um, and he, he's got some um, you know the steps he would take in order to fend off any triggers and that kind of thing so you know uh, but he, he did these things by himself which I thought was great <coughs> yeah that's that's wonderful that's amazing to me and uh how special for you to to share those those things with us um and yeah so that's his his recovery how did he support you in in your healing process as well though <laughs> because i know he did that um i think he made himself interested in it uh although that improved over time um, he, he wanted to support me in my triggers and, and he did his best to actively make it his business, um, to help me overcome my triggers. So one of the things that triggered me early on was all the cities and towns that we passed where he had acted out. And if we, you, but you had to go on this motorway mm. past all of those to get to anywhere virtually. So we would, we would talk about it beforehand and, um, and, uh, you know, he would say, let's play some nice music or do you want to do some crosswords while we're traveling? He would always say, how are we going to manage this? And in the end, those triggers just went away. Um, he was he was almost willing to do anything for my safety. He, he recognized that that was real. And he was um, he was very open and very transparent. I had access to to his phone, to the, all the bank accounts, to all the um, um, downloading the phone bills, everything, you know, uh, I didn't particularly want them, but, um, and we didn't even, we didn't use any, um, 
accountability software. I didn't want to do that. If, if he couldn't do it on his own without having that kind of um, something to to block him, then, you know, I, I didn't want to be the sex police. I didn't want any of that. I just, I wanted right. it to be healthy. So we didn't do that. In fact, I, I was even resistant to boundaries when I learned about them because, you know, I didn't quite understand the position of boundaries then. And, you know, I it, I had this kind of fairy tale image. We don't need boundaries. We, we you know, that's okay. And we, I, we, com we continued with the community. We got really involved in the 12 step stuff, both of us in the um, intergroups and, uh, and giving talks in different places. It took us places. It helped us create some new memories. And that became an important part. Um, and we shared yeah. a vision. Uh, and we used that vision. We kept using that vision to check here how we were going so that we, you know, we weren't always looking back because we'd accepted that the old marriage was dead. But we tried to look forward and say, okay, well, how much progress are we making? Uh, and that's a helpful thing to do. But the difficulty is we didn't keep pace with each other. You know, my recovery was quicker than Richard's in many ways. And we used to say it was like the tortoise and the hare. So I was the hare rushing on <laughs> and he was a tortoise that would just stop and go yes. in his shell, you know. And um, uh, I'd either have to go back and give him a kick or just remind him that, that we needed to do a bit more than we were doing. And, um, but he was good at initiating. He, he would initiate the check-ins. I mean, one of the things we'd had to do very, very early on is I recognized that Richard's trauma was so intense that um, we had to find a safe place to talk. And one of the things we did was um, turn one, we got a shed in the garden, which was quite a cozy shed, and we turned it into somewhere we could go and sit. We went there to do check-ins. We went there to do, um, we took our journals in there. We shared our journals. Um, we used it to, we, we had a gratitude jar. We, you know, we were trying to do all the things that, that came up in the 12 steps and use them uh, to be to be helpful. Um, we did gratitudes on um, tear out diaries. You know, he, mine was a, you know, something that was praising women. And his was, the one I, I got for him was, was a bit more um, insulting than that. It was an insult a day, I think, but <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> it was my bit of punishment. But we, we turned it yes. over and wrote gratitudes. And also one thing that we would surrender. So we got used to that whole thing of higher power even though we had no idea what our higher power was at that stage. Um, and yeah. I, I think you Richard know, it, was it, very, um, it, he was very keen on, uh, he was very curious. He was curious about who, who, he, who he really was. He'd done, you know, he'd lived externally and he was having to slowly move to do the internally. And the work that he do, did on himself made me feel safe even though I guess I was probably mm. the director of recovery to start with, but never the controller. Right. Um, but I had to right. give that up. I had to say, no, I'm detaching. I'm, you know, you're on your own now, mate. It's time that you work out what you need and what you want. And we can talk about it when you're not sure. Um, and, yeah. and that made a difference because that was when he began to be able to tell his story with humility and I was desperate. I wanted a little bit of machoism, you know, not just people pleasing, but also um, being able to tell his story with humility instead of, you know, the poor me thing. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. If you value the content we've shared today, please feel free to rate, subscribe and leave a review. This helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. For more resources, visit appsats.org. That's A-P-S-A-T-S dot org.